Good evening. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm Mark Mankin. I'm co-chair of the Earth Week Working Group. Hi, my name is Katie Morrison. I am the other co-chair of the Working Group. Welcome to the teach-in. The Earth Week Working Group developed this program to be presented during our annual celebration in an effort to enhance the UD community about the data center proposal. The proposal being considered is for a project at the Star Campus for a data center with on-site gas-fired power generation provided by a combined heat and power plant. We hope that you will take the opportunity to use this forum as a starting point to learn more about the proposal. Students on the working group were aware of forums that have taken place out in the Newark community but believe that university students should be provided an opportunity on campus to educate themselves on the issues surrounding the data center proposal. We drew up plans for tonight's event knowing that this has become a very emotional debate, but in keeping with the mission of the UD Sustainability Task Force, we are nonetheless seeking to present an open and honest exchange that will further students' understanding about the potential impacts of the proposed project. It is in the spirit of a respectful exchange of ideas that we invited our four participants that we also ask our audience tonight to engage in as they listen to what is being discussed. We also want the audience to be aware that representatives of the University of Delaware Data Center Working Group are present tonight as well and will provide an update on their ongoing efforts at the end of this event. Our moderator tonight will be Dr. Thomas Powers, Director for the Center for Science, Ethics, and Public Policy. He will be leading the discussion and will have the discretion to end discussion of a particular topic as needed. We ask that you refrain from interrupting the discussion. Occasionally, Dr. Powers will be able to engage the audience and preference will be given to students to ask questions.
under 200 uh, kilowatt hours per month. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very much for efficiency and moving away from fossil fuels. But if you look at the scope of the um, project that they're proposing in order to operate the data center, if we were to do it with uh, commercial onshore wind energy, we'd be looking at 186 wind turbines. I don't know where we'd be able to permit those to, to go up around here. We'd also be looking at over 2,000 acres if we were to do standard PV. So looking at, at that situation the way it is, I, I decided that the most environmentally friendly way to look at the project is to support it because it is distributed energy uh, it's natural gas, which is a cleaner resource, and if you're looking at the grid in general, you're, you're talking about more pollution because, first of all, you've got the distance of the generation from the facility, so you have line losses, and depending on whose information you look at, if you talk to the folks at Delmarva, they, they'll tell you they have a 2 to 3 percent uh, line loss over the distance. Uh, there's other groups out there that'll tell you it can be as high as 30 percent, I don't know where it is, but it's still more than zero. And the uh, other thing is with the grid as it's operating now, we're somewhere between 40 and 50 percent coming from coal, uh, which is a dirtier uh, energy sit, you know, a fuel to fuel power plant with. So we're looking at accepting the fact that we need data centers. If, if we take that as a given, the cleanest way to power those is with on-site generation. Uh, I've also been working over the last few months on incorporating some renewable energy into the program and the data center has agreed and signed a letter of intent with an offshore wind developer to buy their renewable energy credits. Uh, the data center is also willing to buy the renewable energy credits from the university if they move ahead with their offshore wind development. And uh, they're also going to be putting in five acres of solar panels on site, which is a, a drop in the bucket for their total energy needs, but it is a significant step forward to making the um, facility as green as possible. And as far as the uh, negative effects, my personal opinion is it's those are mostly perceived because if you accept the fact that we need data storage and management facilities, the power is going to come from somewhere and whether it's located in New York, somewhere else in Delaware, or in the surrounding states, there's going to be a certain amount of pollution from that. The amount of pollution from a combined heat and power plant located on site will be less than what it would be from any of the other options. So the, the negative impacts are going to be minimal. Also, if you look at the dispersion models uh, with a stack that's 160 feet tall, any pollution that is coming from the facility will be falling outside of the New York City limits. And you're probably looking at around four or five miles before the, the uh, pollution would, would hit ground because if you look at the stack like the pollution comes off in a cone and so there's a certain distance that's why they, they design the stack as high as they do to uh, get the pollution as diffused as possible by the time it gets down to where any of us would be breathing it. So <clears throat> that's how I view the project and not wanting to belabor the point I'd like to have as much time for you all to ask questions so that's what I have to say so thank you. Jim, I'm going to interrupt you just to share that one with you. We'd agreed initially that the participants would say just a little bit about themselves. So oh, I, have, okay. I have information about whom you represent, but please go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm with, uh, I started a group called Partnership for Sustainability in Delaware, a uh, not-for-profit environmental group. Uh, before that, I was with the Clean Air Council, working as their lobbyist for almost a decade. And I had a short stint in there where I was the, um, what we called XCOM, the Executive Committee of the Sierra Club's chair. And uh, I still am a member of the Sierra Club and really appreciate what they're doing, even though we may disagree on this point. And you 
are with Delaware Jobs Now? Or oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we're okay. with Delaware Jobs Now and also uh, Delaware, which is a, a wind developer based here in, well, in Delaware, in Wilmington. Okay, we'll come back to that. So our, our uh, second speaker um, will be Willett Kempton. Willett Kempton is my colleague at the University of Delaware. He's going to answer the first two questions and start out with telling you just a little bit about himself. Okay, I, uh, I am on the faculty here. I do research and teaching mostly in power-related topics. Um, I uh, work with, very closely with Jim on uh, trying to get an offshore wind farm built and uh, appreciated that uh, collaboration along with a lot of other people who worked on that. Uh, I uh, have permitted uh, uh, two power plants, actually, which are both clean power plants. So there's the uh, wind turbine we have in Lewis and uh, the, um, the set of electric vehicles that are being used for balancing power. So I'm uh, familiar with the processes that you go through to permit a power plant, whether it's a tiny clean power plant or a large polluting one, it's the same process. Um, so I'll speak uh, from, that, uh, from that experience and, uh, and knowledge. So, uh, the positives uh, of this are uh, definitely uh, create a lot of jobs during construction, maybe a smaller number during operation. Uh, puts more data on the, uh, on the net, more data storage on the net. Those are definitely all positives. Uh, the negatives uh, would, would be, I think, uh, you know, from, I guess before starting on negatives, you have to make sure everybody has an understanding of the, the size of the facility. Uh, involved here, you've probably seen that it's uh, now 279 megawatts is proposed. So what's a megawatt? Uh, well, <clears throat> the city of Newark, everybody in all businesses in the city, on average use 50 megawatts. So this, the proposed power plant is 279. So uh, we have one facility that increases the electric um, infrastructure in the city by 17 times. Um, it's actually 20% of the state of Delaware. So uh, you have one facility that's adding 20% to the entire uh, state. So it's big, you know, it's not a small power plant. And it's not that uh, those turbines sit idle all the time. They're, they're running, and there's a good reason why they're running all the time. Uh, so they may be displacing other power, you know, we can come back on that issue. But uh, you need to understand this is a very uh, large power plant in relation to anything. Uh, in the city or, or in the area. It's not as big as some commercial power plants, but uh, it's very significant. So uh, when you put a <coughs> power plant uh, uh, in, you know, it's, it's accepted, it's been done in the past, but you do have health impacts. You know, you're burning things that are toxic, and in particular uh, particulate matter, 2.5 microns and smaller. You'll hear probably that mentioned a couple of times, PM 2.5, those are tiny uh, particles that are put into the air, and there's a number of other um, pollutants. But uh, just a rough calculation, looking at the proportion of PM2.5 to other power plants that are documented in their health effects, and also the entire county, uh, that would be expected over the 75 year lease if the power plant is operated over the full time of the lease, uh, to result in about 94 uh, deaths uh, in Newcastle County, not necessarily in Newark. 120 in excess heart attacks uh, and 15,000 some asthma attacks. So there's a you know there's a real health uh, cost here. Uh, now we can talk about whether that power be generated somewhere else and so forth. It's about <clears throat> at least in carbon dioxide, uh, it's about equal to the amount of pollution in the grid. So if you simply turn off other power plants, maybe it's a wash. Uh, but placing it in a populated area of Newcastle County incurs additional uh, mortality and uh, of morbidity. So um, it's hard to get a good estimate on that. It's something like a 60% increase on those numbers. So rather than 94, uh, you're looking at uh, about 150 premature deaths during the lifetime of the plant. You know, it boils down to only one or two per year. You know, is that small or big? You know, if it's my grandmother who dies, then maybe that's big. Uh, if it's not anybody I know, maybe people say it's small. And, you know, that happens when one builds power plants. So you have to, you have to say it's not somehow more evil than any other power plant. But it, at this point, it seems like we're not 
continuing to fill power plants everywhere, and there are alternatives that are that are cheap that wouldn't work on site. I completely would agree with Jim on that. Um, there's also CO2 emissions. I'm about the end of my five minutes, so I'll stop at this point. So the third speaker tonight is my colleague Steve Hagenis, but Steve is not wearing his professorial hat. Um, he's wearing his new art resident hat. Steve? Yeah. Actually, no. no we're gonna, we're gonna I'm sorry. I'll have it. Okay. Okay. As I said, Steve Hagenis. Okay. Um, I uh, have lived in Newark for about 33 years. I've been at the University of Delaware that whole time uh, doing, uh, working on my passion, which is uh, solar electricity. Um, and I've, I've been very um, honored to be able to, to uh, follow that for all that, these number of years. And uh, I'm proud of the fact that the solar energy industry has grown uh, to you know, the size that it has. Um, partly with the help of the Institute of Energy Conversion, where I work. Um, I also, as a resident, live within a mile of the uh, proposed power plant site. And uh, as someone who you know, is involved and interested in both energy, uh, energy issues as well as um, you know, quality of life issues in my, my neighborhood, this is something that I, this project is something which um, I have become very, very uh, interested in and concerned about. So you know, in terms of the positive aspects of it, well, one of them is that um, they are planning to um, install their, or build their, their headquarters to uh, what are called LEED, L-E-E-D, uh, energy standards, which is a very nice thing. It's not necessary. They didn't have to do that, but that's what they're offering to do, so that's a benefit. They're claiming that they're going to upgrade one of the um, power state substations here. It's also not necessary right now. It might be nice in the future. It's an infrastructure upgrade. Um, now, one of the main uh, benefits that the um, TDC people uh, uh, use to um, uh, promote their project is the jobs. And so let's look at that a little bit. Uh, it's sort of hard to make an estimate of what the benefit will be because the numbers keep changing. For example, uh, at one point they were saying there was going to be 4,700 union jobs in the construction of the plant. A couple days later, after some pushback and some questioning, those numbers went down to 1,000 uh, jobs. Um, let's look at full-time employees, because those would be people who would very likely live and work in the, in the new or surrounding areas. Um, at one point, they said they were going to uh, employ directly 640 employees. Uh, that was on October 29th last year. Um, a few months later, uh, they said it would be 290 uh, direct employees. And if you compare that to other data sites, other data centers around the country, and you look at it on a per area basis, that's about six times more people than other data centers such as Intuit or Yahoo or Microsoft would employ. And then if we look at the power plant jobs, um, those are also sort of questionable. They, according to the documents they've submitted, that would be 72 jobs to run the power plant, three shifts, seven days a week. Well, just uh, last week or, or a couple weeks ago um, in Dover, a uh, larger gas-fired power plant is being uh, is going to at groundbreaking uh, by a company named Calpine, and they're only going to be employing 16 people. So 16 versus 72 for an even larger power plant. So the numbers and the benefit as far as jobs is, is quite uncertain. Don't know what to believe on that. Um, now, one, another benefit that they have claimed on their, their website is that they're going to offer uh, internships for UD students. Well, that sounds great. Um, uh, and specifically, um, they say that the part-time positions will be filled by students, including positions loading racks, equipment assembly, and network operations. Problem is, those are not really jobs that uh, engineering and computer science students might, might be involved in. We don't have classes in that here. That might be more appropriate for a trade school or vocational school. Um, and tax revenue, well, that's going to be a benefit. But anybody who would be, in uh, any client or tenant in this location would also be generating taxes for the city of New York. Um, so now, my two main concerns, and that of many residents, are the health and well-being of our neighborhoods and the integrity of this university. Um, I'm going to address the health issues later on. Primarily, the two we're interested in or concerned mostly about is noise and air emissions. 
Um, in particular, I'm very concerned about uh, air quality because my wife, sitting up there, has some uh, very serious lung impairment problems, breathing problems, and so air quality is something of deep concern uh, to me personally. And also, as a member of the university, I am concerned that the university's reputation is being uh, uh, impacted negatively uh, by this. Residents are no longer seeing the university as a good citizen, as a good neighbor, a benevolent force in our community. They're seeing it as someone who's relatively insensitive to the needs and the concerns of the residents. And this power plant is tied to the university. They signed the lease for 75 years. And so whether what happens at this is going to be reflecting on the University of Delaware. Um, and possibly, you know, another possible negative aspect is that there's a lot of other sites that they're hoping to uh, sell or rent or lease at this star campus. And I can see where other tenants would maybe be hesitant to site their high-tech center or their hotel restaurant or wherever it is uh, downwind of a 279 megawatt gas fired plant. Thank you. Okay, our, our final speaker is Brian Hunnish. Uh, Brian, you can introduce yourself and have your five minutes. Just a uh, word of warning, uh, there's going to be a, a pinch hitter after Brian speaks, but um, I'd like a chance to, to um, talk just a little bit before you leave the stage. Absolutely. Thanks. My name is Brian Hunnish. I'm Vice President Business Development and Sales for TDC. So in 2007, the Environmental Protection Agency delivered a report to Congress, and that data center, that, and what it said was that data center power use from an electrical footprint perspective was growing 14% year over year in the United States, and 16% globally. TDC, our objective is, develop, is to develop a series of state-of-the-art, LEED Platinum certified, self-powered, highly reliable, high available, high density, energy efficient, and extremely secure data centers together with a co-located co combined heat power plant, or CHP, to provide both the requisite power and cooling for these facilities. This microgrid facility will be a completely off-grid, deriving power for a rated capacity of up to 248 megawatts. When complete, the facility will support four times the electrical density of today's aging data centers, not interrupt the current demands of the power grid, will be able to contribute additional needed electricity to the grid, and do so with the increased efficiency of thermodynamic engineering. Now that's a mouthful, but that's what I had to get out very quickly because we only have five minutes. Um, what I want you to take away from this, if you're actually one of the three students that are here, um, is that uh, if, if, if I would give an exam as, as the professor, I would take away from this a couple things. One, TDC is taking two existing technologies. We're taking data center technology, and we're taking CHP technology, and we're combining them in such a way that it will be LEED certified, self-reliant, and as defined by the EPA, the Department of Energy, and private environmental clubs such as the Sierra Club and Greenpeace, utilizing CHP technology that is the cleanest sustainable power source available today. So what benefit does this data center project bring to the University of Delaware? Well, TDC's self-powered data center will not only fully support the objectives of the SMART campus, but it will also propel the University of Delaware into a high visibility and unique position among American universities that compete for high, highly sought after federal government R&D grants with immediate access to one of the largest high-performance platform facilities in the world. UD will find itself among the elite of the university R&D groups capable of managing vast amounts of data needed to continue to advance our nation's global leadership in science and technology. UD will have the ability to develop and manage DOE R&D programs like those previously reserved for the facilities at the DOE's uh, SLAC, National Labs for Linear Accelerator Programs at Stanford University, or the DOE's Lawrence Berkeley National Labs for the Cyclotron Programs at the University of California, both of which provide extensive and secure supercomputing facilities available to support local program objectives. However, the takeaway there is that TDC's data center is larger and more reliable and will provide up to 115 megawatts of clean and fault-tolerant computing power and similar projects. The on-site power plant 
will allow for absolute physical security of power distribution and for a unique cyber secure microgrid for fail safe IT operations continuously secured to the facility. TDC will allow UD to compete for and add such R&D program to their graduate curriculum, they will create an offering unlike that of any other university at the Department of Energy Laboratories in the country. And that's because of this best-in-class data center facility. It will bring immeasurable academic and economic benefits to the campus and surrounding community. So part two, what, is the data, what does the data center project bring to the community? Well, aside from bringing in companies to do the research, We'll also be providing an additional clean energy to the grid, meaning fewer power interruptions like we had throughout the winter. An estimated 5.6 million in one-time construction permits and fees, with 80% of that going to New York. Over $245 million in local infrastructure improvements. That's for natural gas, fiber, and electricity. Jobs. There will be 4,770 construction jobs throughout the project. There will be 290 full-time jobs from TDC and 50 part-time jobs. And then there will be another 300 tenant jobs. There will be a solid tax-based residence for city and its residents. We are not asking for any abatements or discounts. So what benefits does the data center project bring to the state of Delaware? Well, the state gets the benefits of everything I just spoke about. They get an estimated $20 million in tax revenue during construction and an estimated $4.5 million in, from income tax, gross receipts, and business taxes. And they also get to put their residents to work. What negative impacts does the data center project bring to the University of Delaware, the Newark community, and the Delaware region? Well, considering all the facets of the project, we do not see any negative impacts at this time. However, I would like to address what appears to be a few of the last two remaining issues when it came to the zoning permit process. First, does the facility support the plans to improve the university? I believe everything that I just covered speaks to that. It will absolutely help the university provide uh, good jobs, a good research facility with a strong data center that allows you to do the high computing you need to get to the next level. Okay. Second, the will the facility impair the neighborhood? It can be broken down into two things. Uh, specifically noise abatement and air quality. In accordance to the federal law, this facility cannot and will not operate in a way that violates the environmental rights of the residents of Newark. Any noise, any gas emissions, and any other byproduct of the operation of the TEC facility will comply with the federal and state regulations and with local ordinances. Noise will be abated by surrounding and enclosing generators of all rotating equipment, by noise insulating walls and ceiling, and air emission regulations will follow the EPA and DENEREC requirements. Period. We can't follow them. So, uh, thank you all. I, I want to ask Brian to just stay here for a bit because he has a certain uh, font of expertise and he's going to leave in a new font of expertise this morning about coming to Melbourne State. So, uh, there is a dispute, um, perhaps between Steve and Brian, about jobs. And let's not focus right now on the construction jobs, but just on the jobs to run the data center. And think about 20 years from now. So we all know that we are in the age of automation and robotics. So tell me, what is, what is the theoretical limit of uh, employment for the data center? What's the least number that you can imagine in 20 years? Working in the data center, let's forget about the power plant aspect. CHP or cogeneration. Yeah, so, so, okay, fine, I'm sorry. The cogeneration. So, so I, I just, I always have this in mind. Labor is a cost. If I know anything about capitalism, and I don't know sure. a lot, but labor is a cost. Absolutely. So tell me, what is the theoretical limit, the lowest number of people who could be working at the TDC? Um, is the data center full? Yeah. I mean, you, you, give me some bread. Yeah, yeah, it's full. You're going, you're going gangbusters. Every year, your wildest dreams have come true. Um, again, I think the numbers are accurate. So I think 290. Two, 290 full-time, 50 part-time. And then the tenants will be bringing in another 300 employees. So whether they bring them in 
as they move in, or they hire them locally, that's up to the tenants. Okay, fair enough. Steve, you've had an issue about the jobs. Do you want to say anything more about that? Well, I'm just curious about, the, for example, even running the power plant, like how efficiently, um, are, are we being told numbers that are, that sound good because they've made a good selling job for the politicians, uh, um, you know, and, uh, and, and they, um, they're, they're what people want to hear. Um, but remember, really bad ideas can always be justified on the basis of jobs. So just jobs alone is not the reason to go forward. So real briefly, and then you're going to okay. trade places. Well, it kind of goes to saying small is clean and big is dirty, but we said earlier if I will. But uh, no, our cogeneration facility is not constructed similar to the one that's being constructed downstate. That's being done with just a couple of very large turbines. You don't need the same amount of manpower. We've set up uh, M plus 2 plus 1 configuration with a bunch of smaller gas turbines and steam turbines in such a way that there will be a different manpower. So uh, now Brian is going to lead the stage, and Rick Berenger, where, where are you in the... Rick has some technical expertise that um, TDC thought they would like to add to the panel, so we're going we're gonna to swap up one time, just one time, and we're going to continue uh, with the, the questions. So in this period, we're going to ask the panelists to answer rather quickly, and it's not expected that every panelist will want to answer every question. So I'm going to go through these questions and, and probe a little bit where there's some interesting disagreements, but there's no expectation that we're going to go uh, in order. And, and as long as it works somewhat orderly, I'll, I'll let you choose who gets to uh, answer. Yeah, so this is, these answers should be about two minutes. We're going to try to keep it to a minimum. So the first set of questions, there are two questions about the logistics of the energy source for the data centers. So the first question is, where do most other data centers get their energy for power heating and cooling from? And how and why is this project different? Okay. Where do most others get their energy from? And how and why is this different? Who wants to? Well, I'll start. Most data centers get their power from grid power. Uh, the, the, uh, the ones that have a big name behind them, like Google and Apple Computer, will either put on site or purchase uh, renewable energy so that they can say that they're 50% or completely uh, clean energy, but that's actually in, in trading with other sources on the grid because the grid will give very high uh, reliability. So that's the normal operation. There are some small data centers that operate on cogeneration. Uh, even part of the time, there's one place to run most of the time, but it's, it's a very small one. It's not really comparable in size. Now, I think one thing about companies like Apple and Google is they have a name to protect, so they don't want to have you know, pollution or CO2. Uh, in this case, the, the uh, you know, TDC, although we know about them here in Newark, it's not known and they don't have to really worry about that sort of tarnishing of their name by having the pollution associated with their operations. It may go to the universe, the tarnishing may go to the universe. Um, well, one thing I, I agree with something that Brian uh, had said earlier, and that's that this would put Delaware and uh, University of Delaware in an elite uh, position, and that certainly would because if this plant goes through, we would have one of the highest carbon footprints of any university in the United States. The highest. The highest. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, just this week there was an article in Wired magazine that Apple uh, has shrunk its carbon footprint with its new data centers. It's now getting it's offsetting, like Bill had said, 94% of the electricity to run their data centers from renewable electricity and uh, solar, wind, geothermal. Um, and not saying that they're running it from that directly, but they're offsetting their carbon footprint with, with those. So that would certainly be a, a positive strategy. But you know, the residents here, I want to make clear, the residents aren't against the data center. We're against this, the power plant and the massive size um, that it, that it uh, represents. But one other thing, if this was such a great idea, why isn't Amazon, Google, and Microsoft doing it? What I'd like to add to this discussion is if you're really honest about the carbon emissions, the university would be 
responsible for whatever part of the uh, data center's capacity they're buying. That would be their responsibility for the carbon footprint. You can't really put the entire carbon footprint on the university. And likewise, the tenants of the data center, whoever they're selling the data services to, would credit those carbon emissions to their portfolio. So if we ever get to the point where we're doing some type of trading system, that would be the appropriate way to, to break it down. So is it, you're, you're saying that the claim that UD would move in that number one spot is kind of accounting here? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily an accounting error, but let's say they're buying 15 megawatts worth of data processing from the data center. That whatever the carbon emissions are that is associated with that 15 megawatts would be accounted to them. And if Chase Bank is buying 20 megawatts worth of capacity, then that would go towards their uh, carbon footprint. <clears throat> That's not the way it's currently uh, accounted for, but to do it any other way is a little bit dishonest. Okay, so fair enough. You're saying that the current accounting system is not really adequate, doesn't really right. represent who's using what, and, right. and you would ask that the users take on some of that right. footprint, maybe a, a big toe of the footprint. Or yeah, because another way to look at it is currently the university is buying data services, and that, because it's happening off campus, they're not accounting for in, in their carbon footprint, and they should, you know, so regardless of where it is, they, they should be accounting for it by where the end use is. sustainability point of view, doesn't it make more sense to supply a new facility and a new entity with the least carbon footprint that it can produce? And I think that by going with a tri-generation facility, one that's not only generating electricity, but generating thermal loads, and recovering the heat from its, its burn, most efficient technology we have currently and the least carbon footprint that could be produced for that use and still meet the reliability that, it's, that the data center will need. Okay, so this, this question about carbon footprint is obviously important. Um, carbon, as we all know, is not merely a local problem, it's a global, global problem. Suppose that we were really taking a data center offline that were currently powered by coal or something like that. We were, we were replacing it with cogeneration under the model of TDC. There I can see the swap, but isn't it the case that you will be adding to emissions when this plant is built? Although, albeit less than you would be adding had you powered it in some other So then you need to build a uh, UPS 
to a gas-fired cogeneration system eliminates most of that uh, excess equipment. Uh, it certainly eliminates the multiple grid connections, it eliminates the UPS, and eliminates the diesel generators. Uh, it is reliable because it does not have a long grid connection to it, so you don't have the vulnerability of wires. UPS for what the audience? UPS is Thank you. 
doing this, and the reason is it's difficult to keep, you know, rotating equipment at, at high temperatures working reliably over time. Five percent outage sounds terrible uh, for a, a data center. Now I know you get multiple turbines and all that, but you just don't. You can't get those numbers that you guys have been talking about. The high voltage system is extremely reliable. It's not the same as the neighborhood power lines that have trees fall on. And if you want reliability, the way to get reliability at that site is to use two of the existing lines. And if you want to be super reliable, run 14 miles up to Coatesville, where you've got a much a totally different part of the grid. You put those together on a ring bus. The idea that you put batteries in there, nobody would do that. I mean, I'm not sure if you had any power engineers looking at this design. But you put a ring bus with the two or three high voltage lines. You draw off that. There's no transients. You you know, one drops off, and the other one just keeps going. And any one 138 kV line will power that data center. It's 180 megawatts and under these conditions with a less than a 12 mile run to, to uh, Kearney. So, uh, it does, the design doesn't make sense from a business standpoint. I mean, forget the pollution and all that. I mean, you're trying to sell a reliable product. Why would you make your own generation? PGM's got 1,300 generators. That's how you get reliable. Jim, you want it, I cut you off, and, sure. and you get at least a minute, so... Okay, well, I don't need a minute. I, I don't understand how still being connected to the grid doesn't give them that backup power in addition to everything else they're doing. That's redesigned for two minutes. So I'm just going for what I hear from TDC. I don't see okay. Yeah, so that, can you repeat that because it's a little bit muddy. Yeah, oh, sorry. It has to be designed. It has to be designed for two-way flow. You have to plan that in, and it has to be part of the design. So, what they've said is that they're going to sell a much smaller amount of power out than what they would need to keep the system going. So, there's a capacity issue and bidirectionality. So, Rick, do you know of an instance? I believe Fairfield University has a setup like this where they're drawing a very little bit of electricity from the grid if they stay connected. And primarily, they're using co generation. So, I, I don't know any of the details, but. Yeah, this, this is the first. Comments. One is that I addressed the question of the different uh, uh, other power plants in the affidavit that I submitted to the Board of Adjustment hearing uh, last month. And I have a copy of that if anybody would like to see it, but it does list a lot of the other data centers in the country who are all grid connected. Second thing I'd like to say is that the type of natural gas power plant that they are proposing, combined heat, power, and ship, it is the absolute best, most efficient way of generating electricity from fossil fuels. I, you know, I, I applaud them. It's a logical type of power plant to install in this place. If you have a thermal host, if you have a customer willing to accept who can use the heat that this plant generates, that's really what makes it so efficient is the fact that, yes, you're generating electricity, which is only about one-third efficient, the other two-thirds of weight, instead of wasting that heat, you use it. And most large CHP plants are, according to the EPA, connected to oil refineries, chemical processing plants. Somebody who needs heat and steam 24-7 and can use it year-round. If you look at the University of Delaware's energy, heat, and water usage for building heating and water for the entire campus, according to their the last uh, carbon footprint analysis that they did, this data center produces more than 10 times the heat that University of Delaware would be able to accept. Now, originally the power plant people said that the University of Delaware was going to be their thermal host, but that has been clarified by the um, University of Delaware's representative in an in interview with the uh, news journal. So the question comes, who is going to be the thermal host? Who is going to absorb all that massive amount of heat that you're generating to allow you to have a CHP? summer, most of all of that steam is going to cooling the data center and cooling the inlet air to the turbines. There is very little steam left over at the end of that. I said, the, during the summer, uh, most of the steam that is being generated 
will be used to cool the data center and uh, the inlet air to the turbines to keep their efficiency high. Uh, there is very little steam left over at that point. During the winter, uh, a lot of the steam will go to the steam turbines for electricity generation and the operation of the gas turbines and reciprocating engines will be balanced down to find that sweet spot between heat generation and electricity generation. Uh, there may be some excess steam available for export in the winter. Export to if we can find a use. So uh, we have built into our schedule a little bit of time for audience Q&A. Uh, we have quite a few more questions to go, but now that this discussion is fresh in your mind, I'd like to invite, first of all, the students to ask questions. Yes, go ahead. Oh, please, you're going to have to come to a microphone.
279 megawatt power plant. That's a very difficult question for any of us because we have no idea of what else is being proposed there. You know, this is a real project, and it, if this one would be called shovel ready, uh, anything else is just at this point just talk. Hi, I'm Justin Freshman. I have my special credentials here. <laughs> yes. You're a student. I'm a student. The third That's one, Brian. The third student. Yeah. 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 This is just kind of a, a brief two-part question, and it'll start with asking Kenton, because you had an interesting factor statistics stating that there will be an increase in deaths, specifically a 150% increase. I'm just curious as to how you came to that point. Uh, it wasn't 150%. Oh, okay, it was okay. Over yeah. the total lifetime of the facility, uh, 150 total deaths caused by, you know, premature deaths caused by the facility. Um, all power plants, well, all combustion processes emit, uh, you know, by byproducts of combustion. Uh, and uh, there's quite a bit of study of how power plants affect uh, mortality and, and morbidity that is helpful. Uh, so this is based on a uh, comparison of both total power generation and uh, health effects of power generation in Newcastle County. So there's statistics on that. And it's also based on a comparison of the emissions from Hay Road, which is a very large power plant uh, to the north of us, uh, uh, and, uh, and the size of the, of the TDC facility. Not size in megawatts, but size in emissions. So based on those two comparisons, which yield similar results, you would say that that power plant might uh, yield 94 deaths. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's put in the middle of a populated area, whereas, for example, Hay Road is on the uh, edge of the Delaware uh, estuary, so the prevailing winds tend to blow the, uh, the uh, pollution away from the population. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you look at uh, highly populated areas that have power plants, uh, there's a study uh, in uh, Energy policy just earlier this year, I would recommend, which shows how you calculate higher mortality in when power plants put in highly populated areas. Very careful study, but all these things have large air bars on them. But the image is, you know, it's a power plant that follows regulations, it's clean, you know, but clean is relative to other power plants, and we've been living for a hundred years making decisions about electric power, which cause mortality and morbidity. The last 20 years have gotten a lot better about figuring out the numbers, and then that's resulted in you know tightening up uh, emissions regulations. But I just since you've asked the question, I want to correct something uh, Rick said that all new you know this is the cleanest of new power. That's not true at all. Half of the new power plants built in the last couple of years have been wind or solar. So you know half of our new generation is almost entirely clean. You know, there's some pollution during manufacturing and stuff, but it's a tiny fraction. So, you know, we are accepting uh, sort of current technology and locking out the possibility of new technology powering this data center in the future. You had a, a real quick follow-up question? Yeah, it's got stuff like that. Okay. And this goes to Rick. I mean, I'm not entirely sure how much you agree with the statistic, but assuming that it's 100% accurate, then what do you think would be the ultimate justification for the loss of lives? Well, I can offer a couple of things. First off, the emissions, national ambient air quality standards, we have to meet those at the end of the day. Those were set to protect the infirm, not just, you know, robust humans. They were set at levels, and you can check, you can go back to the CFR and look at where the levels were set. They were set to protect asthmatics, they were set to protect people who have suppressed immune systems, they were you know, they are protective <coughs> of the population. Uh, and our plant has to, we cannot get a permit to produce emissions that would cause a violation or in local area of uh, those national ambient air quality standards. Uh, I'd also point to the fact that New York City has multiple power plants in the city probably the largest, densest population in the country. A lot of those plants have been co-gen since day one. Um, they set actually a pretty good model for how do you balance the need for electricity uh, that people have and create and how you, you know where you use it and where you produce it. Uh, the city of Philadelphia has co-gen power plants in the middle of it. Also, so you know, if you know, there is no.
nothing that we do, or very few things that we do, that don't have some potential to impact somebody somewhere. Um, you know, this is, you know, that's why the laws are set the way they are, uh, is to reduce those impacts, and we have to comply with them. So just to, to make sure that the point of the second question is, is being answered, you raised the examples of denser populations. So we produce electricity in New York and in Philadelphia. And in answer to the question, you know, how can you justify 150 lives? Well, the, the answer is, gosh, we need a lot of electricity in New York and Philadelphia. So does that same argument really hold for TDC plus cogeneration? We really need data cogeneration in, in island mode here. Well, that would it. I, that raises another question. Where would you put it, and where wouldn't it kill somebody if that's the statistic you want to bring to it? Yeah, so presumably the, the answer is somewhere with less population density because it's a matter of exposure. Still going to get somebody. Right, you're certainly right. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have another question. Sorry, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Linda Grant. I'm currently an undergraduate senior studying environmental
agree with that definition of sustainability that's sort of standard in the literature. Um, and uh, to be uh, building a new facility that puts 800,000 metric tons of CO2 per year into the atmosphere does not qualify. How loud will it be if you're like walk, just walking to a football game or if you're, and how loud will it be in different places? Because I would like a mile away will be, how loud will it be? Is this the high general question? Can anybody answer that question? The city noise ordinance, I think, is at the boundary with the residential areas, which would be north of the, of the railroad tracks, would be the closest. Um, has to be at our property line has to be 52 dB. Um, it has to meet the residential noise standard. So it would be similar to walking around with the ambient noise in residential areas currently. Well, I live near the Hay Road power plant, and when I ride my bicycle past there, uh, from, from the road, which is within a few hundred yards, and probably 200 yards of the actual turbines, I can't hear it over the sound of the wind. You know, just the ambient noise in the area, you, you can't hear it above that. You, you ought to go over there sometime and listen. If it was an absolutely uh, calm day, you would hear something, but generally by the river there, there's enough wind that you don't even hear it over the wind. I don't know what the decibels are, but if you want to get an idea of what it would sound like, and that's a turbine with no shield. One of the things that a lot of us uh, residents really value about New York is that it is a quiet, peaceful place. And um, the uh, noise uh, expert who was uh, who testified at the Board of Adjustment hearings uh, last month said that, um, according to the measurements and the, the information that, that he was given, that the uh, noise uh, in the neighborhoods surrounding the data center would drown out most natural sounds, namely soft sounds like birds, bugs buzzing, and leaves um, rustling. And if you want to hear what a data center could sound like, go to face or go to um, YouTube and uh, search for Facebook noise complaint. There's a two-minute news broadcast from Forest City, North Carolina, where Facebook built a data center, and people who live a mile away can barely have a conversation on their front porch due to the roar of that power plant. Now, I don't know what kind of shielding it has. They've said that they're going to have much better acoustic uh, protection on their facility. But I just want to ask this question. If this power plant is built and it's running and it has all these premier uh, clients using it, do you think that the city of New York is going to actually come in and shut them down if they're too loud? <laughs>
did not mention the berm anymore. He mentioned about the building being uh, acoustically prepared to it. That, that, so I had meetings personally with Mr. Honus and the group, and we discussed the, uh, the ambient sound and the 50 uh, decibel uh, restriction, which is equivalent to a 24-hour a day conversation taking place outside your window. Make no mistakes about that. So I asked if they would consider some kind of a sound barrier like the Edward Highways. And the answer was, well, then that would re reflect sound from the trains back into the neighborhoods. And that's not an adequate answer. And I just want to point that out. I mean, the reason I question this project now as vociferously as I do is because the answers have changed every time the question has been asked. There was a reference to EPA brought by Mr. Hunter tonight without an explanation of the fact that I questioned the letter from the EPA. They responded with a conference call and then a follow-up letter to me which said they did not endorse this project. They were not endorsing the size of this project or this type of project. They were endorsing simply CHP as a methodology that is more efficient and cleaner than building a fossil plant without CHP. Okay, so I'm the, the, the real fact is though that nothing generates less emissions than nothing being built. Okay. Sparinger, it's a black one. Well, you're, you're assuming that nothing, I mean, if nothing is built on that, that site and it doesn't get built anywhere else, that's assuming that there's no need for increased data storage and processing. Uh, because if you build it here, or there, there will be emissions. If you're saying that we don't need data centers and no new data centers are built, then yes, we can have no new emissions. But uh, as Brian Hanisch said, the, the growth in the data industry is 14% a year. <laughs> I am not saying we don't need data centers. I am saying our data centers, but by building a power plant on the site, not oh, yeah. so we, we have I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. But whether it, there's the power plant on site or there's power plant to support it somewhere else in the grid, there will be emissions. And if this is increased capacity, which it will be, there will be new emissions. And especially when you're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, it doesn't really matter where on this planet it's put into the atmosphere, it will affect everyone. Let's, let's move on. We have we have a student question, and we're going to move on with the questions that have been prepared by the task force. Go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Rachel Coyne, and I'm an undergraduate public policy and mass communications major at the university. Um, my question, since I'm actually writing policy about the power plant to send to President Harker and the Board of Trustees, is why exactly, if this is such a great project that will launch us into the league of elite colleges, is the leasing agreement? protected under, against the Freedom of Information Act. Because we've requested it twice and it's been neglected both times. And so if this is really a good project, why is there shame in releasing the leasing agreement? Not really sure that anybody can answer your question up here, but we'll give it a, a crack. There any? That's, that's a question for lawyers. Thanks very much. Okay, so we're going to report this report. Thanks, please. So we're going, we're going to move on. We have another set of questions about community and University of Delaware impact. There's been a good bit of, of overlap already, so we're going to try to keep from asking the panelists to repeat themselves, so that doesn't do us any good. So the, the first question in this set, um, and I, I think certainly Will has already spoken to this a little bit, how does this project impact the health and well-being of UD students, faculty, staff, and Newark residents? So, do we have anything more to say about the impact on health? I think that the particulate uh, emissions, the PM 2.5 that Will uh, mentioned earlier, is absolutely something that we need to be concerned about. Uh, I was shocked that, the, that Brian earlier said, oh, we don't have to worry because it's going to be blown five miles away. So, no problem, right? I mean, just don't move there, you know? Um, no, it is something. You're, you're citing a fossil fuel burning power plant in a densely, the second most densely populated town in Delaware, and um, regardless of which direction the wind blows, we're all downwind from it eventually. That's that's exactly. 
exactly the point. Uh, we're all downwind of it. We just need to define what the it is. Because if it's located in Newark, or it's located, you know, you're pulling the power from the grid from all the power plants around here, the, the pollution ends up here anyway. You know, most of the, the, most of the emissions that we're going to get are, are going to be upwind of us, not all of them. And, you know, the pollution just mixes in the atmosphere, and we're all going to be exposed to it, regardless of whether it's right here in Newark or it moves down the road somewhere. Even if it's pulled from the grid, that, that energy is putting pollution in the air, and it, it's going to affect everyone. Is there a distinction between the pollution that will be felt more locally and the pollution that we all have to account for as greenhouse gases? Does anybody want to make a distinction about Well, that? there is. There are certain uh, pollutants that are going to affect health, you know, NOx and SOx and particulates. But you, we'd have to get someone here who's an expert in how the dispersion works to tell you whether, you know, injecting at this point or that point, how it's going to affect us. You know, the, the numbers will it used are, are accepted. Uh, you, uh, did you use the EPA models? Okay, okay. Um, because you can look at the same modeling on transportation or, or any other pollution source. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't look at what's happening at the port with the ships coming in. That's an incredible, incredible amount of uh, particulate pollution for the communities of South Wilmington. You know, you can, everything we do has pollution associated with it, and, and we need to keep that in mind. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. No, well, slightly disagree. Okay. That. 50% of new power plants are clean power plants in the last couple of years. You know, mostly wind, some solar. So you, if you just bought new, you bought new stuff off the grid that somebody built, you'd have half the size of possible capacity. Well, that's also why I've been working with the data center to bring on offshore wind and solar. Not going to uh, offset 100%, but we're working in that direction. What percentage will it offset? Do we know? What's your wildest dream? Oh, we, my wildest dream, if you're asking me that, would be 100%. Okay. Is it, I mean, so you probably crowd it as reps, so that's right, like 100 reps a year, or is there a number yet? Well, it's a matter of uh, the size of the facility that's built. Uh, the first one we're looking at buying 100 of their credits, which will be instrumental in helping to get the facility up and running because of what's been happening at the uh, legislative level. So it's, it's another way since we, we don't have the, uh, any agreed upon price for offshore wind tracks. Rick, do you want to mention something about health? Just talking to the health again, uh, the dispersion modeling, we have to meet the ambient air quality standards at each and every location, look close to the plant and at distance. So it's not this or that, it's everywhere. And you know, the modeling has shown that we will not cause a violation of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. Yeah, those health impacts are for plants that meet the ambient air quality standards. So the, the second question in this set really is a kind of inside baseball question and has to do with the university's climate action plan. So the climate action plan, and I expect the two gentlemen at the end of the table know a little bit more about it than, um, than you all do. It includes emission uh, reduction goals, and so what will the CO2 emissions be from the project? I think Willett has spoken to this a little bit, but we should, we should be clear about this. And um, if you would, again, how would this compare with CO2 emissions if the project um, ran off the grid. So on the grid, off the grid. I'm going to let Willa talk about some of the, the quantitative numbers, but I want to make um, two points about this. One is that I've been told that the University of Delaware administration understands that they own these CO2 emissions. They are on our balance sheet, regardless of what customer they are. We're leasing the STAR data center. There are emissions. Second thing I would like to say, since it was mentioned earlier that this power plant is consistent with the STAR uh, campus plans, I'd like to read uh, a little uh, a section of that. The University of Delaware, this is from the master plan. Uh, the University of Delaware has firmly committed to being a leader 
in sustainability and maintaining a green campus. The university's climate action plan and President Harper's signing of the American College and University President's climate commitment dedicates the University of Delaware to pursue carbon neutrality and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And then the second thing which I would like to quote is the university's strategic plan there under the category Initiative for the Planet. We must demonstrate exemplary and far-sighted stewardship of our resources to our students, our community, and the world. As a cornerstone to that commitment, the University of Delaware should undertake to become carbon neutral. That's really hard to balance with the idea that we're going to be increasing our CO2 footprint by a factor of five with this power plant.
that panel where we were to cite names, but this is a person who works for a very large electric company, and their company has many coal burning power plants. Uh, so he was asked, you know, where are you guys continuing to build coal power plants? Uh, and he said, no. And they said, well, what about the other major utilities in the country? Because there's a lot of coal being burned today. And uh, I could quote him exactly because it was a memorable statement about his colleagues and other coal, uh, sorry, other electric utilities. He said, anybody who builds a coal power plant today is a moron. So, although there's a lot of coal on the grid now, what we've seen is complete evaporation of new builds. I don't disagree with that at all. But when the Clean Air Act passed in 1970, the prediction was that the old coal plants would go out of use, be retired, and it hasn't been until now, 40 years later, that you're starting to see that. So I'm going to move on to the next set of questions. We're, we're getting a little bit short on time. Um, and this has been mentioned again briefly in the opening statements, but if any would, would like to pick up on the following question. The power plant requires the construction of two natural gas, uh, two new natural gas pipelines. What are the potential implications of these pipelines, including route? is why, if you're so concerned about reliability, and I understand that it's going to cost a significant uh, chunk of money, a couple hundred million, I believe, for you to, to uh, uh, lay these two uh, uh, different gas pipelines, why not site your uh, facility right at the uh, gas hub and not have to run the lines and, and uh, go through all of the uh, expense with that? Wouldn't that be higher reliability? Reliability seems to be your, your dominant um, uh, concern. So, what you're suggesting is that every data center that's like this in the future would be located on a gas pipeline? Sure, it would save you a couple hundred million dollars from having to and, and go through people's, you know, tearing up the city of Newark and all the uh, White Clay Creek and wherever else you're going to have to run it to bring the pipes in.
when you count how much investment you've got, you know, it's almost half. I believe that, that 210 million was counted in that to get the total 45 percent that was said to be already invested in the facility. I'd be glad to be corrected on that. I can't answer the question. Fair enough. So um, let's switch to a different natural resource. Uh, what about water? Does anybody want to speak to the implications uh, in terms of water demand for TDC plus co-generation? The TDC demand for water will be far less than what Chrysler's demand for water was and coming from the same source that the Chrysler source was, which is United Water. One of the 
great things about Newark are the community parks, our neighborhood parks. And I want to take you to the one that I go to a lot, and that's Phillips Park. Um, it's right across from where the um, power plant data center would be. And um, it's a great place. The bike trail winds through there. There's basketball, there's tennis, there's skateboarders. You can see there's you know, people pushing kids in strollers on the bike trail, and people are jogging and playing with their kids on the playground. You can sit and listen to the you know, uh, blackbird, red-winged blackbirds in the marsh there. And you know, I just wonder, how is that all going to change with those 10 gleaming 160-foot tall smokestacks across, right across a quarter mile away and the noise, the dull roar of the uh, power plants? Are we going to really enjoy Newark and have the same quality of life? You know, who's the winners and the losers here? The winners are the investors, whoever they are, we still don't know. The employees, the, the management of the company, who's the losers? Those of us who are going to have our quality of life impacted and um, people who lived in Newark because they like it as a nice, quiet, peaceful college town, well, that could be going um, and uh, be changed by this. So, um, you know, in terms of what's the unique characteristics about this location that could lead to a negative outcome, I think I just laid that out. enjoy the park when Chrysler was on the facility? I, I understand that, but uh, you're I talking about for the quality of life for a lot of people when that plant left, their quality of life went down the toilet. So, uh, well, you talk to anybody in the auto workers union, they have a different point of view on that. Uh, you know, it, that, that also is part of uh, quality of life. And I think you'll, you'll enjoy the just as much as you ever did. Just another question of whether there's a local demand for power. There's a market. We can tell whether there's demand for power. It's called the capacity market. It's managed by PJO. It's a rock bottom. So anybody who builds power plants will say, I'd never build a power plant in New York. We lost our shirts building in those kind of markets. So there's not a local demand. Excess power in the system, though. But to Rick's point about the university being a consumer for heat, the heat. Well, I haven't seen any of the university saying that they are, that they want it. I don't believe you have a contract to sell it. I... Just the opposite. The university spokesman, Andrew Boyle, said very clearly that the University of Delaware was not going to be the thermal host. I was just addressing local. So, we have actually about 10 minutes for questions. And again, I'm going to open it up to students. And sorry, students, if you've already asked a question, but hang back. And we're going to have some time for some residents and questions. I thought you were asking for questions. Excuse me, young man, are you a student? OK. Uh, uh, do we have a student? wants to go first, can you please, thank you very much. Go ahead. Hello, thank you for coming to the University of Delaware. I'm a sophomore computer science major. And I see a major compromise here. It seems we don't need the power necessarily, and that the emissions will be about the same on the grid off the grid. Would you consider not building the power plant but keeping the data center if we're assuming that we want the data center? simple answer for that is no. Uh, the concept that TDC has is to build a combined heat power plant and data center, a self-propelled data center, not an on-grid. As a resident, let me just say again, I think most residents would be very fine with having the data center here. It's the power plant that's our concern.
that this proposal is a pretty decent one, okay? And I was thinking about the infrastructure that you need, right? You mentioned that you want to be close to the Amtrak train line, because that's where the major fiber optic cables run, right? And the other things you need then for your power plant are you need lots of water to cool it, and you need gas, right? You need new gas pipelines. There is no gas, there are no huge gas pipelines right here, right now, right? But if I now, if there's, you're going to run one large gas pipeline from Hokessa, which is about nine miles away. That's also about the same distance as it is from Hokessa to any other point on the Amtrak train line between here and Wilmington. Okay? And your source of water is United Water, which, and its main source is Stanton, where it gets 30 million gallons a day. You need maybe three million, right? So my question is this, why not build your project in Stanton? You have to run the same gas pipelines, that's where your water is, and moreover, with your um, filings with the Board of Adjustment, you had these enormous list of signatures, which were mainly people who live to the east of here, in Bear and Wilmington and Stanton and Newcastle and places like that. It seems there are a lot of people out there who really would like to have this project built, right? The state of Delaware would collect the same taxes. Newcastle County would collect the same taxes. There was a motion before the Newcastle County Council endorsing this project. Why not just build it someplace near Stanton or within a few miles of there?
clarification of terminology, Anybody please? Anybody want to speak to that? Well, when I spoke about tenant, it's possible that somebody like Chase Bank or Google would be a tenant in the data center. You, that would be the client of the tenant. Do you mean that they would have an office in the center or that they would be wired to the center? They'd be wired there. I, I call that a client, not a tenant. Well, it's, it's just a matter of the terminology that the company uses. That's why I asked the question. Okay. Fair enough. A question over here. We, we have a little bit of time, at least 10 minutes. So, question over here. Don't, don't be discouraged if you think we're coming close to 9 o'clock. We'll go a little bit over. Yes, I'd like to revisit the comment that stated that most of the pollution will come down four to five miles away from the power plant. We have an epidemiologist in our neighborhood, and she provided a research paper that found increased emergency room visits by residents within 1.8 miles of gas-fired power plants. Now let's be clear, the pollution is going to come down right here.
This job, this project, will be two to three years worth of work for me. This job is a billion dollars and two to local economy. This billion dollar project, not in Pennsylvania, not in New Jersey, not in Maryland, Mexico, India, Greece, or China, right here in the state of Delaware. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. If we take 30% of that billion dollars, put it to wages, that's $300 million. Over a three year period, that's $100 million a year. That's a thousand people, like myself, making $100,000 a year. That's me going to Cleveland Avenue and buying a new car. That's me going to Sears Hardware, getting all new appliances for my house. That's me getting a new roof for my house. That's me going down to the Delaware beaches, working on my tan for a week and a half. That's me putting my son into the University of Delaware, student loan free. Signs that by a thousand. If this project goes forward, $4.71 million just in permanent fees. Already, the TDC has spent $5,000 in permits. The people here in Newark are complaining about a $90 a month sewer fee. That $5,300 is 60 people not paying that sewer fee. $1.8 million a year. Okay, this is my question.
project. Since you know that a natural gas company is not investing, do you know who is investing? Would you tell us? Uh, not at liberty to, but uh, Mr. Hanish may be able to. Okay, but Mr. Hanish left the panel, so well, uh, that I, question I, goes unanswered. Okay, okay. Uh, I would okay. like to inform everyone, in case you don't know, that this question has been asked many times in different venues, whether in newspapers, through letters, or in, or in public like this. The Delaware Coalition for Open Government has asked this question to the trustees in letter form, FOIA, three times, no answers. Uh, in reference to, and this should be short, in reference to who is building the pipelines, a few weeks ago I spoke to the enforcement officer of the Federal Energy Regulatory Firm. <laughs> and the gentleman I spoke to was Mr. Thomas Lemon. If anybody would like to see his phone number, I have it at my seat. In talking to him, I asked, who is building the pipelines? And his reply was, after doing research, that the pipelines were built by two companies. One is Eastern Shore Natural Gas, and the other is Del Mar. So, we have time for one brief question for Mr. Carter. I am a student, I'm a full-time PhD student here, but uh, prior to that I spent uh, 28 years as a manager in the Department of Natural Resources. Um, I also want to disclose I'm conservation chair at Del Rolabon, um, but in fairness. We, we've heard a lot of discussion about local air quality impacts, and um, in Delaware we have some problems with the baseline data to really look at the local issue. Newark is a particular location that we don't have nearby ambient air quality data that's um, highly accurate. Um, I know uh, Mr. Black mentioned um, some other areas like South Wilmington. Um, there was a law written for some of those areas along the coast recognizing this that we would put them into place, but Denrec has never implemented that law. So my question is, um, if we don't have that baseline and we haven't collected that sample and we can't look at the seasonal variability, how do we, with what confidence can we model this and be assured that not having impacts to the public locally, and that it is going and dropping five miles away and not nearby. Um, that requires data, it requires baseline data to compare that, um, a lot of wind energy and things that we're not monitoring for. Does anybody have some ideas on that? Speak to that question. From an air permitting standpoint, that is a common problem. There is air quality, detailed air quality data collected few locations, and then there is meteorological data collected, upper atmosphere meteorological data collected at a few stations, but it is the common practice to use that data uh, for the region and to make your calculations based on that, do your air modeling based on that. That is the federal regulation and the, and the accepted practice. If you would if you'd be very brief, we're going to have a last question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Molly Gartland. I'm uh, an undergrad student here at the university. And this is more of a general question for the panel and for the moderators. Um, as a student, I've been really concerned with this issue, but I know there are a lot of students who didn't know about it. And when you opened the panel, you said that this was an opportunity for students to come, primarily to come and ask questions. Yet, I didn't see I, I heard about it through a Facebook event, which is a very informal way of inviting students, and I understand it's probably a good method, but is there, is this being recorded or taped? Can it be sent out to students? And if not, um, is there a way for students to voice their issues on this and voice their concerns and ask questions either to individual representatives? Will there be a way for students to continue to follow up on this issue if they find out about it post discussion? Thank you. I do understand that this is being videotaped. That's as much as I'm coming. And anybody could talk about student involvement? Do you know where the information will be available, where the video will be available? We do not. We do not, but can, can the Sustainability Task Force agree to make that information available to students? Can we, can we continue this task this evening? Some of my family couldn't get tickets in 
and now that I see all these empty chairs, I'm wondering what happened. Data center. 
Center Project at udel.edu is our website. Or excuse me, is our email address that uh, you can send information to the working group. We've received a fair number of uh, emails, we've received letters, and we continue to welcome those contributions, uh, particularly those that are substantive and will inform our work as it relates to making a recommendation to the upper administration, as I said. So we're in the process of a due diligence phase. That phase is continuing. We anticipate that our work will be done in the next six weeks. That will be the work of the working group. We are collaborating with, uh, and we've hired two consulting firms. We've hired Environ, which is out of Princeton, New Jersey, and they are working with us in the working group to look at the environmental impact of the data center and the associated power plant. In particular, they are looking at many, if not all, of the issues that were discussed tonight. So they're looking at emissions, including greenhouse gases, the impact of those emissions on human health, the noise that would be generated, um, the visual effects, water use and storage, transportation, public safety, and environmental justice. So those are specific areas that we are going to be collaborating with Environ. They are gathering data from the data center, TDC. TDC continues to provide documents that have been requested um, by us and by Environ. Now there's a separate consulting firm, HDR, that we have enlisted. And the role of HDR is to address the other issue that we've heard quite a lot about tonight, which is the sizing of the cogeneration facility or the power plant that's accompanying the data center. And so we are committed uh, to a data center. We think it's in the best interest of the University of Delaware, the STAR campus, our students, staff, faculty, and community. We're very committed to ensuring that that facility has a right-sized cogeneration facility. Um, in terms of timing, we will be making a recommendation, as I said, uh, within the next six weeks to the provost and the executive vice president of the university. They will um, be receiving that recommendation and will, will then act on that recommendation or those sets of recommendations, if you will, um, within about two, two to four weeks, depending on how uh, the information is transmitted, and particularly if, if our findings uh, leave them asking additional questions that they might need to research. So that's probably the best I can give you right now in terms of that exact timing. The only thing I want to add in, in closing, again, is, is in addition to thanking you for all your time, is to make it very clear that um, the working group's work uh, will be made public. So when we are done and we issue this uh, report and series of recommendations to uh, the upper administration at the university, that report, either in its entirety or a summary of that report, and, and the difference there, just to be clear, is there is some confidential information that we're receiving that's going into our findings um, that may uh, not be made available. But the rationale for our findings, what our recommendations are, and the data underpinning those recommendations will be made publicly available. So I think we've got a clear process. We've got a very uh, specific timeline for you now moving forward. And again, I just want to, want to thank everyone tonight. I want, to, I want to thank the Sustainability Task Force for organizing this event. Um, I, I uh, honestly uh, and very firmly believe that we need more events of this type at the University of Delaware, which really involves engagement of all members of the community. And it's great to see our students here. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Gautam. Gautam I'm a student or part of the Earth Week Working Group. And on behalf of the Earth Week Working Group of the UV Sustainability Task Force, I would like to thank you all for attending this event. I would especially like to thank our panelists and our moderator for taking time out of their busy schedules and making this teaching possible and all of you for participating in this teaching. And Earth Week activities go on throughout the week. There will be a town hall meeting tomorrow to discuss sustainability issues among students so they can think about and discuss these issues at Reading Hawk or Lounge from 6 to 8 p.m. Just to repeat, a town hall meeting at Reading Hall Lounge from 6 to 8 p.m. for students. Thank you all for attending this event, and I am really honored to be here.